The social fabric of Anglo-Saxon England in the centuries preceding the Norman conquest of 1066 was a tapestry woven with threads of hierarchy, power, and a complex system of social classes. This was not a society of free-born Englishmen, as commonly perceived, but a deeply stratified one, where freedom and opportunity were distributed unevenly. At the apex of this social pyramid stood the nobility, a diverse group wielding significant influence and authority. The highest echelon was occupied by the earls, individuals who governed vast regions, some of which, like Northumbria, were once independent kingdoms. These earls, wielding the power of former monarchs, were the king's representatives in their respective domains. Beneath them were the Eeldormen, terms signifying one senior in age, which aptly described their role as prominent noblemen in the king's service. These individuals, prominent in the army and the royal court, served as the king's deputies in law courts, playing a crucial role in administering local government in the shires and overseeing justice in the hundred courts, local institutions first documented in the early 10th century. The country gentry, the things, comprised a broad spectrum of individuals ranging from privileged nobles to retainers. By the 1060s, approximately 4,500 of these local landowners, with their estates defined by charters, held sway over the countryside. These individuals, though not as powerful as the earls or eldormen, wielded considerable influence within their respective regions. More powerful nobles, including the king himself and bishops, enjoyed a special privilege known as bore, or personal protection. This privilege granted them unique rights, including compensation for offenses committed against their property or servant, and the authority to administer justice within their domains. Unlike fines levied on members of the lower classes for crimes against their households, which were paid to the king, those with boar received the fines themselves, ensuring that justice was served in their favor. The free Anglo-Saxon peasant farmer, known as a chioral in Old English, constituted a significant segment of the population. These individuals possessed a measure of freedom, including the right to carry weapons, clear themselves of accusations by swearing oaths of innocence, and even defend others in court. They played a vital role in the army and local courts, owned a portion of the village land and livestock, and were obligated to respond to royal commands to fight and attend court under the threat of fines. These freemen, referred to as Sokemen in the Dana law, represented approximately 15% of the population, with a particularly strong presence in the eastern county. While many Sorrels lived a life not significantly better than their semi-free neighbors, the defining characteristic of their status was their freedom to give or sell their land to others. Despite being under the authority of a superior lord, freemen had the right to choose their lord, signifying a degree of autonomy. However, it appears that lordship was less influential in eastern England, where the development of manners and labor service E features of medieval feudalism was less advanced compared to other parts of the country. As the Anglo-Saxon period drew to a close, a seorl could attain the rank of a thetan by accumulating five hides of land, owning a bell house, and securing a place in the king's hall. Below the free peasants lay the gibber, semi-free peasants obligated to perform labor service for the local lord in exchange for their land. By the mid-11th century, these semi-free peasants constituted approximately 70% of the population, their status reflected in the hierarchical terms used in the Domesday Book, often later simplified to villain. This simplification highlights the gradual evolution of feudalism, with its manor courts and labor service, forcing villagers to provide free labor on the Lord's land, a system that had its roots long before 1066. The existence of slavery in Anglo-Saxon England is a stark reminder of the harsh realities of the time. This class, identified by the Old English term Theo, comprised about 10% of the population and lacked any legal rights beyond the minimal expectations set forth in Christian teaching, such as the freeing of slaves forced to work on a Sunday. Slavery's origins were multifaceted, stemming from war captives, descendants of slaves, and those enslaved as punishment such as individuals working on a Sunday or convicted of certain forms of theft. Some individuals even sold themselves into slavery to avoid starvation, highlighting the desperation that drove individuals to this extreme measure. 
Bristol, port with a grim history, specialized in the shipping of slaves to Ireland centuries before its infamous role in the transatlantic slave trade to America. This trade, vehemently opposed by Wolf Stan, Bishop of Worcester from 1062 until his death in 1095, saw Anglo-Saxon slaves from Bristol shipped to Dublin, where they were bought for labor in Iceland, Scandinavia, and even Arabic Spain. The slave trade was eventually banned in 1102, resulting in a loss of revenue for the crown, which collected a tax of four pence for every slave sold. This ban, however, only served to partially curtail a system that had become deeply ingrained in the social fabric of the time. As in any society, differences in wealth were reflected in personal adornment, quality of weapons, and the ability to display wealth and power through various means, such as protecting retainers and bestowing gifts on churches. However, a curious pattern emerged in the mid-10th century, with a noticeable decline in the use of precious metals for personal adornment, despite the discovery of new silver sources in the European Hearts Mountains in the 960s and the continued practice of lavishing gifts upon churches. This decline was also evident in the production of elaborate swords with inscribed makers' names. This decline, however, was not attributed to poverty, as evidenced by the abundance of coin hoards discovered in the mid-1060s, indicating substantial portable wealth in the hands of wealthy elites. Instead, this shift suggests a transformation in patterns of production and consumption, reasons for which remain unclear. This change coincided with other transformations, notably the increasing reliance of elites on urban trade for high-quality goods instead of household or traveling craftsmen. The Germanic world, once characterized by gift-giving, tribute-taking, and shifting personal relationships, was gradually giving way to a society where values were measured and exchanged in coin, services were commuted, and subjects were taxed. Social position, once influenced by achievement, increasingly became tied to birth, reflecting a shift towards a more structured and hierarchical society. The transformation of Anglo-Saxon England into a society driven by monetary values and fixed social hierarchies mirrored the broader changes occurring in Europe during this period. As the era of the Vikings drew to a close, the continent was embracing new forms of governance, social organization, and economic act. The impact of these changes, evident in the decline of precious metals in personal adornment and the shift towards urban trade, or shadowed the emergence of a new era, one where economic and political power would continue to be shaped by evolving social structure. The centuries before 1066 were a period of significant change and transformation in Anglo-Saxon England. While the exact causes and consequences of these changes are still debated, it is clear that the society was becoming increasingly hierarchical and stratified. The emergence of a powerful nobility, the decline of the free peasant farmer, and the persistence of slavery all point to a society where power and wealth concentrated in the hands of a select few. This transformation, however, was not a sudden event, but a gradual process, driven by a confluence of factors, including political instability, economic change, and the influence of outside forces. This period of transition, ultimately leading to the Norman Conquest, marked a turning point in the history of England, laying the foundation for a new era of feudalism and social order. The population of England in the mid-11th century, on the cusp of the Norman Conquest, hovered around 2.5 million, a figure that remained relatively stable until the 16th century, despite the demographic fluctuations of the intervening century. This seemingly small population, however, masked a reality of limited lifespans and precarious living conditions. Life expectancy for a man in early medieval England was a mere 35 years, while for a woman, it was even lower, reaching a mere 25 years. This stark disparity was largely attributed to the dangers of childbirth, constant threat that loomed over women throughout their reproductive years. In essence, life expectancy in early medieval England mirrored the dire realities experienced by the poorest, least developed countries, LEDCs, in the 21st century. This stark comparison comes into sharper focus when we consider the tragic example of Sierra Leone in 2002, where a catastrophic civil war plunged the nation into the depths of poverty, leading to a female life expectancy, 26 years. 
Even in this dire situation, the life expectancy of women in Sierra Leone was one year longer than the estimated average for women in early medieval England. Furthermore, the male life expectancy in Burkina Faso in the same year, 35.3 years, closely matched the medieval male average. These stark figures highlight the precariousness of life in early medieval England, where disease, injury, and a lack of access to basic health care were constant threats. This grim reality is further emphasized by the striking contrast with current life expectancy projections for Britain in 2021, where men are expected to live to 74 years and women to 80. This significant jump in lifespan reflects the advancements in healthcare, sanitation, and overall living standards achieved over the century. The reasons behind the grim realities of life in early medieval England, comparable to modern-day LEDCs, are rooted in a lack of understanding of fundamental scientific principles. The lack of knowledge about germ theory, the foundation of modern disease prevention and treatment, meant that individuals were constantly vulnerable to infections and illnesses. This absence of scientific understanding also meant that the treatment of injuries and diseases relied on pre-scientific approaches, often rooted in superstition and folk remedies. In a world devoid of antiseptics and anesthesia, death was a constant companion, an unwelcome but ever-present reality. This does not imply a complete absence of medical knowledge. Indeed, some medical manuscripts from the later Anglo-Saxon period have survived, providing a glimpse into the medical practices of the time. These manuscripts, likely representing the knowledge available to the most educated, also incorporated folk traditions used by less literate rural communities, highlighting a blend of formal and informal medical practices. One of the most famous of these manuscripts is Bald's Leech Book, a physician's reference book dating back to around 900 to 925. This manuscript, a compilation of diverse knowledge, quotes from classical works and incorporates folk remedies, reflecting the fusion of different tradition. Bald's Leech Book offers a treasure trove of remedies, including formulas and herbal treatments, alongside superstitious beliefs about their application. It includes practical advice, such as the use of oak bark as an astringent, but also delves into the realm of the supernatural. A chapter devoted to elf shot, diseases believed to be caused by elves, showcases the blend of rational and magical thinking prevalent in the time. The manuscript identifies various types of elves, including wood elves and water elves, each associated with specific diseases and remedies. Bald's Leech Book provides remedies for a wide range of ailments, from fevers, tumors, and snake bites, to abscesses, skin diseases, paralysis, and wounds. The inclusion of both practical remedies and supernatural beliefs reflects the complex tapestry of medical knowledge and practice in early medieval England. Another valuable manuscript, Laknunga, a collection of medical texts primarily in Old English, likely copied in southwest England around 1010, offers a glimpse into Anglo-Saxon popular religion within a Christian context. This manuscript features a number of charms, revealing the role of superstition and religious beliefs in healing practices. Alongside these charms, Laknunga includes references to the use of various herbs, including mugwort, plantain, watercress, chamomile, nettle, crab apple, chervil, and fennel. These references highlight the importance of herbal remedies in the treatment of illnesses, Furthermore, the survival of Anglo-Saxon translations of classical works, such as Dioscorides' Herbal, dating back to the 10th century, provides evidence of the persistence of some aspects of classical medical knowledge in early medieval England. These translations, while reflecting a limited understanding of the scientific principles behind these remedies, demonstrate a willingness to learn from the past and incorporate knowledge from different sources. Despite the challenging circumstances, living standards might have actually improved following the end of the Roman Empire, leading to positive knock-on effects on nutrition and health. The end of imperial taxes and long-distance trade may have led to greater access to protein sources for many individuals in the countryside, especially in England, where a protein-rich diet, common in Northern Europe, was likely a contributing factor to the increase in average height until the early 8th century. However, this trend reversed by 725, with the average Western European height returning to the lower late Roman level. 
This shift in height coincides with an increased reliance on arable farming, accompanied by open fields in England during the three centuries leading up to 1066. This agricultural shift, while boosting food production, might have led to a reduction in protein intake, contributing to the decrease in average height. Despite these fluctuations in height, other evidence suggests that average height has remained relatively stable over the past 5,000 years. Nevertheless, the limited access to protein for children in early medieval England likely delayed their reaching full adult height until their 20s. Yet, even with this delayed growth, their final height was comparable to modern adults. The staple diet in England on the eve of 1066 consisted of bread, wheat, and rye, the latter being more common in wetter regions. Archaeological evidence reveals that these staples were supplemented by peas and beans, while barley was used for brewing. The increasing reliance on arable crops was facilitated by favorable climatic conditions between the 9th and 12th centuries. Combination of these factors, including the lack of scientific understanding, the reliance on folk remedies and superstition, and the fluctuating dietary patterns, created a complex environment for the people of early medieval England. While they faced numerous challenges, their resilience and resourcefulness enabled them to adapt and survive, laying the groundwork for the future development of England. The lives of Anglo-Saxon women were far from confined to the domestic sphere, as commonly depicted. They occupied a space within society where agency, power, and economic independence were not merely tolerated, often enshrined within law and custom. This wasn't a society where women were mere possessions, where their rights and contributions were acknowledged and respected, at least to a degree that would surprise many in later period. One of the most striking aspects of Anglo-Saxon women's lives was their right to own property, privilege not always enjoyed by women in later periods. At marriage, a woman received a morgengifu, or mourning gift, from her husband, a customary act of generosity that could encompass land and other valuables. This gift, unlike the later concept of dowry, was considered her own property, which she could sell, bequeath, or manage as she saw fit. This right to own property extended beyond the morgengifu and encompassed the ability to acquire and own substantial estates in their own right. Elfgifu, a woman living around 970, owned 15 estates in and around Buckinghamshire, demonstrating the extent to which women could hold significant landholding. Edgifu, a fair, a powerful figure in the 1060s, held estates amounting to 27,000 acres in eastern England, making her an immensely wealthy woman. Her wealth and autonomy illustrate the degree to which women could accumulate economic power and influence within Anglo-Saxon society. Furthermore, a considerable number of royal land grants were made jointly to husbands and wives, signifying the shared ownership and control of property within marriage. This practice highlights the recognition of women as equal partners in managing family assets. Presence of over 25% surviving Anglo-Saxon wills made by women bequeathing their own property further underscores their right to dispose of their assets independently. This stands in stark contrast to the legal restrictions imposed on women after the Norman Conquest, where a woman's ability to make a will without her husband's consent was rendered null and void. Beyond the right to own and manage property, Anglo-Saxon women had unhindered access to the courts, allowing them to enforce their rights and settle disputes independently. This legal protection, along with the right to participate in the legal system, ensured that women were not vulnerable to exploitation or abuse. In addition to their economic rights, unmarried aristocratic women held significant positions of power and influence, especially in the running of abbeys. These women, often acting as abbesses or holding positions of authority within religious institutions, played pivotal roles in managing estates, overseeing the lives of nuns, and contributing to the intellectual and spiritual life of the time. The legal framework surrounding marriage further underscores the protection and rights afforded to Anglo-Saxon women. A woman's consent was deemed essential for a marriage to be considered valid, ensuring that she was not coerced into unwanted unions. Furthermore, a woman was not legally liable for her husband's actions, shielding her from potential financial or legal consequences 
stemming from his behavior. While monogamy appears to have been the prevailing norm by the 11th century, influence of Viking traditions may have introduced challenges to this ideal. This influence, however, was not sufficient to overturn the principle of monogamous marriage. A law from 1008 further highlights the legal protections surrounding women's rights within marriage. This law stipulated that widows were obligated to remain unmarried for one year after their husband's death. After this period, they were free to marry whomever they wished, and were entitled to a substantial share of their husband's inheritance. This legal provision recognized the widow's right to choose her own path, demonstrating a level of autonomy not always present in later periods. Anglo-Saxon laws also contained severe penalties for sexual assault highlighting the importance placed on protecting women's physical safety. Compensation was paid directly to a free woman if she was the victim of such an assault, indicating her right to justice and redress. However, it's crucial to acknowledge that laws often reflected the prevailing societal norms and values, not necessarily the reality of everyday life. One law from the reign of Nut states that a woman guilty of adultery would lose all her property and have her nose and ears cut off. This harsh punishment, however, appears to have been an exception, as the usual punishment for adultery was financial rather than physical. Overall, the available evidence suggests that the average Anglo-Saxon wife was valued and respected, with her economic rights safeguarded by law and custom. Wills frequently reflect this respect by showing men leaving valuable property to their female relatives, underscoring the importance placed on women as heirs and inheritors. Regarding children, Anglo-Saxon laws reveal a notable absence of automatic bias in favor of husbands with respect to custody in cases of separation. Similarly, there was no bias in favor of the husband's family in the event of his death. This suggests a more balanced approach to parental rights and the well-being of children, a perspective that would not always be the case in later periods. While our understanding of the economic activities of women during this period is less complete than for later centuries, certain manufacturing skills, such as cloth making, appear to have been associated with women. This included high-status production of gold-embroidered cloth, alongside more mundane articles, showcasing a spectrum of skills and contributions within the broader economy. The evidence suggests that Anglo-Saxon women were not confined to the domestic sphere but were active participants in the social, economic, and legal realms. They owned property, managed finances, accessed the legal system, and held positions of authority. While societal norms and limitations undoubtedly existed, the overall picture suggests a degree of agency and autonomy that would be absent in later periods. Their lives were marked by a blend of tradition, innovation, and a sense of inherent value, offering a glimpse into a complex and often overlooked aspect of Anglo-Saxon history. The two decades following the Norman Conquest in 1066 witnessed a seismic shift in the fabric of English society, a transformation that reshaped the very landscape of the English countryside. Norman invasion, a watershed moment in English history, marked not just a change in rulers, but a complete overhaul of the existing social and economic order. The once familiar Anglo-Saxon hierarchy, with its intricate web of landholding and social obligations, was supplanted by a new, rigid structure, built upon the principles of Norman feudalism. This transformation was not merely a matter of replacing one set of names with another. It involved a wholesale dismantling of the old order and the establishment of a new system, one that prioritized the Norman elite at the expense of their vanquished Anglo-Saxon counterpart. The Norman conquest, therefore, wasn't just a military victory. It was a carefully orchestrated campaign to reshape the very soul of English society, consolidating Norman power and ensuring their dominance for centuries to come. At the heart of this transformation lay the land. The Norman conquerors, led by William the Conqueror, understood the immense power inherent in controlling the land and its resources. The Norman conquest, therefore, was as much about land acquisition as it was about military conquest. The lands of England, once held by Anglo-Saxon lords, were seized and redistributed, effectively creating a new landowning class, one that was overwhelmingly Norman. This dramatic shift in land ownership had far-reaching consequences. 
The once powerful Anglo-Saxon aristocracy, whose wealth and influence were inextricably tied to their land holdings, was effectively dispossessed. Their lands, the foundation of their power and prestige, were transferred to Norman hands, relegating them to a secondary, often marginalized position within the new social order. The Domesday Book, compiled in 1086, stands as a testament to this dramatic reshaping of the English landscape. This comprehensive survey, ordered by William the Conqueror, documented the ownership of land throughout England, providing a snapshot of the new feudal order that had taken root. The Domesday Book reveals a striking reality. The vast majority of land, previously in Anglo-Saxon hands, was now held by Norman lords. At the apex of this new social pyramid stood the Norman tenants-in-chief, also known as Baron, who held their land directly from the king. These were the king's most trusted lieutenants, men who had played crucial roles in the conquest and whose loyalty was paramount to William's continued rule. This elite group of approximately 180 individuals represented the pinnacle of Norman power in England. The Domesday Book provides a sobering insight into the extent of Norman dominance. Out of these 180 tenants-in-chief, only two were Anglo-Saxon. A stark indication of the complete displacement of the Anglo-Saxon aristocracy. This stark disparity underscores the extent to which the Normans had seized control of the English countryside, effectively displacing the previous ruling class and establishing themselves as the new masters of England. Below these powerful barons were a further 1,400 medium-sized landowners who held their land from the tenants-in-chief. Within this tier, Anglo-Saxon presence was slightly more pronounced, with approximately 100 Anglo-Saxon landowners still maintaining their holdings. However, their power and influence were significantly diminished compared to their pre-conquest counterparts. Beneath this stratum of medium-sized landowners, there existed a vast number of subtenants, estimated to be around 6,000. This group included a significant number of Anglo-Saxons, many of whom had once been landowners themselves before the conquest. The Normans, however, had restructured landholding, often leasing out land to Anglo-Saxons who had previously owned it, thereby retaining a measure of control over these lands. This system of subtenancy, while allowing some Anglo-Saxons to retain a connection to their ancestral lands, served to reinforce the Norman dominance. It provided the Normans with a means to monitor and control the use of land, ensuring that they remained in ultimate control of the resources of the English countryside. The Norman conquest, therefore, wasn't just a military victory. It was a deliberate and systematic effort to reshape the social and economic landscape of England. The Normans, through a combination of force and cunning, effectively displaced the Anglo-Saxon ruling class seized control of the land and established a new social order built upon feudal principles. The message was clear. The English countryside was now under the control of an occupying power, and the Norman elite, through their strategic control of land and resources, were firmly entrenched as the new masters of England. This fundamental shift in power and control, so vividly captured in the Domesday Book, would have long-lasting repercussions shaping the course of English history for centuries to come. The tapestry of medieval English life is intricately woven with the thread of the manor, a word that encapsulates not only the physical estate, but also the intricate system of governance and social structure that characterized rural life. The manor, a concept that existed both before and after the Norman conquest of 1066, served as the cornerstone of medieval English society shaping the lives of lords, peasants, and everyone in between. At the heart of the manor lay the lord, the ultimate authority who held dominion over the land and its inhabitant. The lord, often a nobleman or a powerful institution like a church or monastery, possessed a wide range of rights and responsibilities. The lord's power manifested itself most visibly through the manor court, forum for justice, administration, and dispute resolution. This court, staffed by the Lord's officials, held sway over the affairs of the manor, adjudicating disputes between tenants, enforcing rules, and imposing fines for transgressions. The fines, a significant source of revenue for the Lord, served as a deterrent against misconduct and provided a tangible reminder of the Lord's authority. The manor courts, however, were not confined to the mundane matters of daily life. 
Some lords, particularly those with close ties to the king, wielded extraordinary power, encroaching upon the traditional authority of the royal sheriffs. These powerful lords by the 13th century had secured the right to preside over justice in their manor courts, handling cases involving theft, crimes punishable by death, and even the regulation of the price of bread and ale, matters that normally fell within the purview of royal officials. One such powerful landlord, the Bishop of Winchester, possessed an additional layer of authority over the system of Frank Pledge, a centuries-old institution dating back to before the Norman Conquest. Frank Pledge, a system of mutual responsibility, bound groups of ten households, known as tithings, together, making them accountable for the conduct of each other's members. All males over the age of 12 were required to be part of a tithing, under the leadership of a tithing man, who was responsible for producing any member of his tithing suspected of a crime. This system, while seemingly archaic, played a vital role in maintaining order and social control within the manor. While the manor courts were capable of administering justice in serious matters, they more often concerned themselves with the quotidian affairs of the manor. They established the rules governing daily life, oversaw the election of local officials like the reeve, responsible for administration, and the pinder, who rounded up stray cattle. They witnessed the transfer of land, a significant event in the life of the manor, and oversaw the payment of Harriet, a customary payment to the Lord, upon the death of a tenant, often taking the form of the tenant's best animal. The manor court also enforced the Lord's rights over the land, punishing those who allowed their cattle to stray onto the Lord's pasture, or who cleared woodland without permission, a practice known as a sarding. Villains, unfree tenants who worked the land in return for protection and a share of the harvest, were subject to fines for refusing to perform their labor service on the Lord's demesne land, the land directly farmed for the Lord's profit. The emergence of the royal courts in the late 12th century, specifically the common law system, introduced a new layer of complexity to the system of justice in England. One of the core principles of common law was that only freemen, those who held their land freely and owed no labor service, could bring complaints to the royal courts. Villains, bound to the land and obligated to labor service, were denied this right, leaving them dependent on the manor courts, which were often biased in favor of the Lord. This disparity in access to justice created a stark divide between freemen and villains. Cases frequently arose in the royal courts where one party accused the other of holding land for which they owed labor service, a charge designed to get the case dismissed. This practice, which effectively shut out villains from the royal courts, further solidified the control that lords exerted over their tenants. In 1224, the royal court refused to hear the case of William of Pilton, a villain from Somerset, because it was discovered that he owed labor service to his lord. The court ruled that William, as a villain, needed his lord's permission for his daughter or sister to marry, a further illustration of the limited rights and freedoms enjoyed by villains. The manor, with its system of landholding and labor service, was the defining feature of medieval English rural life. The manor lands were typically divided into two categories, demesne land, directly farmed for the lord's profit, and land held by tenants, who either paid rent or provided labor service in return for the right to cultivate the land. While this system has often been attributed to the Norman conquest, it was, in fact, an intensification of existing practices, rather than a complete innovation. The late Anglo-Saxon countryside already contained a significant population of semi-free or unfree individuals, bound to the land by obligations to their lord. The Norman conquest, while undoubtedly contributing to the consolidation of this system, did not create it. The abolition of slavery in England in 1102, under the Statute of Westminster, serves as evidence of this continuity. The fact that the lowest strata of the rural population were already so heavily exploited rendered the institution of slavery redundant. The statute, passed under the auspices of Archbishop Anselm of Canterbury, declared, let no one hereafter presume to engage in that nefarious trade in which hitherto in England men were usually sold like brute animals. A survey of a church estate at Pinbury near Cirencester, Gloucestershire, conducted in 1120, 
provides a glimpse into the workings of a typical manor. The survey revealed that the Demesan land comprised approximately 400 acres, while the remaining 300 acres were worked by villains. These villains, in addition to tending their own land, were obligated to provide five days of unpaid labor per week on the Demez. The nuns of Can, who owned this estate, were not exceptional in their demands on their tenants. The Domesday Book, compiled in 1086, records that this estate also held nine slaves. These individuals would have been freed by the 1120s, thanks to the Statute of Westminster but it is worth considering whether their lives were significantly improved by their newfound status as villains. Were they burdened with a similar workload, albeit without the label of slavery? The manor, a microcosm of medieval society, was a complex and intricate system of social and economic organization. It shaped the lives of its inhabitants, from the lord who held the reins of power, to the villains who toiled the land in return for security and a share of the harvest. The manor, with its courts, its obligations, and its system of landholding, played a crucial role in the social, economic, and political fabric of medieval England. It was within the confines of the manor that the rhythms of rural life unfolded, shaping the destinies of generations and leaving an indelible mark on the landscape of England. The life of a villain in medieval England was a tapestry woven with threads of obligation and hardship constant struggle to maintain a foothold on the land they worked while navigating the complex and often oppressive system of feudalism. While the image of the villain toiling away on the Lord's Demesan land, biding unpaid labor service, is often the dominant narrative, it only tells part of the story. The reality was a multifaceted system of rent and service, a delicate balance between the Lord's demands and the villain's desperate need to secure a livelihood. Labor service while a significant burden, was not the sole means by which villains paid their rent to the Lord. Another common practice was the payment of champart, a share of their crops and animals, a system that effectively levied a tax on their harvest and livestock. This payment, often a fixed proportion of their produce, ensured that the Lord benefited directly from the villain's labor and resources. Further adding to the burdens of villainage was the payment of money rents a system that required villains to pay a fixed sum of money to the Lord, often in addition to labor service and champart. Some unfortunate villains were subjected to all three forms of payment, creating a system of multiple obligations that squeezed every last bit of value from their labor. On the manor of Childhampton in Wiltshire, for example, villains owed the Wilton nunnery a yearly rent of five shillings, labor service, and a tribute of a cock, three hens, and a share of their grain harvest. This complex system of payments created a stark choice for villains, either to endure the heavy burden of labor service or to pay cash rents, which freed them from the demands of physical labor, but still left them reliant on the Lord's favor. While many villains preferred the latter, seeking to maximize their own time and effort on their land, the realities of life as a villain often dictated that they had little choice but to accept the burden of labor service. Beyond the core obligations of labor, champart, and rent, a web of additional payments and restrictions further entangled villains in the Lord's power. Merchants, payment to secure permission for a daughter to marry, served as a reminder that even the most personal aspects of life were subject to the Lord's control. Harriet, a death duty levied upon the death of a tenant, often taking the form of the deceased's best animal, further underscored the Lord's right to claim a share of the villain's possessions, even in death. Lair White, a fine levied for forbidden sexual activity, primarily on women, epitomized the moral control that the Lord wielded over his tenants, dictating not only their economic lives, but also their personal conduct. Shivages, payments to secure permission to leave the manor, further restricted the villain's freedom of movement. Faldagium, a payment to graze animals outside the Lord's fold, subjected even the most basic needs of their livestock to the Lord's control. Entry fines, levied on those seeking to acquire new plots of land, ensured that the Lord profited from every transaction within the manor. Talages, a land tax, further imposed a financial burden on villains, draining their resources and leaving them with little room for improvement. Suit of Mill, 
particularly profitable obligation for lords, forced villains to use the lord's mill at his prices. This practice, which effectively created a monopoly over grain processing, allowed lords to extract significant profits from their tenants, further enriching themselves at the villain's expense. Around the year 1300, the Bishop of Durham, for instance, derived a staggering 10% of his annual income solely from suit of mill, a testament to the profitability of this practice for lords. The oppressive nature of villainage was not lost on those who were forced to endure it. In 1293, a man in Worcestershire took his own life in the River Severn, rather than submit to the Earl of Gloucester's demands to take on land that would solidify his status as a villain. The shame and indignity of villainage, the loss of freedom and autonomy, were so profound that this individual saw death as a preferable alternative. Despite the hardships and humiliations, conditions of villainage were slowly evolving throughout the 13th century. While villains were still subject to restrictions, their status was no longer equivalent to slavery. The evolving legal landscape, coupled with the growing influence of custom and tradition, provided some measure of protection for villains. Custom of the Manor, a body of established practices and unwritten rules that governed the relationship between lord and tenant, offered some protection to villains. This custom, rooted in local practices and precedents, served as a guide for both lords and tenants, establishing a framework for their interaction. The custom of the manor also served as a bulwark against the arbitrary power of lords, ensuring that villains were not subjected to capricious exploitation. Most lords, recognizing the value of a stable and productive workforce, allowed their villains to make wills, a testament to their ability to manage their own affairs and to engage in the buying and selling of land, provided they met their obligations and paid their heriots. While this right was subject to the Lord's permission, nevertheless represented a step towards greater autonomy for villains. Despite the theoretical power of the Lord to evict his villains, this practice was relatively rare. Most villains passed their farms down through generations, establishing a long-term connection to the land and a sense of stability within the manor. In some cases, villains even managed to prosper, accumulating wealth that sometimes surpassed that of their free neighbors, demonstrating that even within the confines of villainage, there was room for personal advancement. As the 13th century progressed, a growing number of lords became willing to accept cash payments in exchange for releasing villains from specific services recognizing the potential economic benefits of a more flexible and potentially more productive workforce. This practice, while still contingent on the Lord's discretion, offered a pathway to greater freedom and autonomy for those villains willing and able to pay the price. However, the burden of villainage varied significantly from manor to manor. On the estates of the Bishop of Worcester in 1299, instance, Tenants owed the bishop four or five days of labor service per week. In addition to other dues, they were also charged a rent for their land that was three times higher than that charged to freemen. This demanding system resulted in these villains paying between 29 and 33 percent of their net output to the bishop, a significant burden that left them with little margin for personal improvement. Other estates, however, were more lenient in their demands imposing a lighter load on their villains. This variation in the severity of villainage highlights the complex and often uneven nature of feudalism in medieval England. One size did not fit all, and the experience of villainage varied widely depending on the individual lord, the traditions of the manor, and the prevailing economic conditions. The desire for freedom, however, was not limited to individual villains. Communities across England actively resisted their status as villains long before the widespread social upheaval that followed the Black Death in the 1350s. In 1280, peasants of Micklover, Derbyshire, peeled to the royal courts, arguing that their manor, once part of the royal lands, could not possibly be subject to villainage, as villainage did not exist on crown lands. Despite their spirit defense, the peasants of Micklover lost their case, highlighting the power dynamics that favored the lords and the limitations of the legal system for those at the lower end of the social hierarchy. Nevertheless, their defiance was not an isolated case. 
1278, tenants at Halezo in Shropshire engaged in a similar legal challenge, seeking to escape the bonds of villainage. Further challenges occurred at Mildenhall, Suffolk, in the 1320s, and at Ingatestone, Essex, in 1346, all unsuccessful in the face of the combined forces of determined landlords, royal courts, sheriffs, and the threat of fine. For those villains who were unwilling to accept their lot, running away represented a more effective, albeit perilous, form of resistance. It offered a temporary escape from the constraints of the manor, but the risk of capture, punishment, and the loss of their land and livelihood made it a gamble that few were willing to take. The story of the villain in medieval England is a story of both hardship and resilience. While they faced a system that sought to control their lives and extract every last ounce of value from their labor, they also developed strategies for survival and even advancement within the constraints of villainage. The quest for freedom, both individually and collectively, was a constant thread running through their lives, a testament to their indomitable spirit and their unwavering desire for a better life. The social landscape of medieval England was a complex tapestry of intertwined threads, where the lines between free and unfree were often blurred, and the struggle for autonomy played out on a local, individual, and even familial level. The institution of villainage, while undeniably a system of servitude, was not a monolithic entity. Its nuances and variations, shaped by the specific circumstances of individual manners, the ambitions of lords, and the tenacity of villains themselves, created a diverse and often surprising picture of medieval rural life. The legal definition of villainage, which categorized individuals as unfree and subject to labor service, did not always reflect the lived realities of these individuals. Some villains, through hard work and shrewd management, accumulated wealth and influence, surpassing their free neighbors in both material possessions and social standing. These wealthy villains, defying the constraints of their legal status, asserted their ambitions in subtle yet powerful ways. One such example is the use of personal seals by villains, privilege legally reserved for freemen. Despite the legal ban, some villains of Peterborough Abbey boldly used their own seals when entering into agreements with their lord. This defiance, a silent assertion of their growing power and independence, underscored the limitations of legal definitions when confronted with the realities of lived experience. The presence of wealthy villains was not a singular phenomenon. Over generations, their ranks grew, creating a significant segment of the rural population who, while technically unfree, enjoyed a level of prosperity and autonomy that challenged the conventional understanding of villainage. This growth, however, also presented a vulnerability for these upwardly mobile individuals. Ambitious rivals or enemies seeking to exploit the legal distinctions between free and unfree could use a villain's legal status as a weapon, attempting to undermine their position and claim their possessions. As late as 1460, long after villainage was on the decline, John Paston of Norfolk found himself accused by an enemy of being descended from villains. This accusation, a common tactic for extortion, demonstrates the enduring power of legal definitions even when social realities had shifted. Despite the presence of these prosperous villains, the 1290s, a period of peak population growth in medieval England, still saw approximately 60% of the rural population on arable land categorized as unfree. This figure, while significant, was not uniform across the country. Certain regions like Kent, the Western Midlands, the Southwest and the Northwest had fewer villains, with lords relying on paid laborers and money rents to manage their estates. East Anglia and southern Cambridgeshire presented a different picture. Here, manors tended to be smaller and dominated by a larger number of free smallholders with exceptions like the vast church estates of Barry and Ely, which housed a significant population of unfree tenants. Conversely, in areas like Oxfordshire, villains accounted for 80% of the population, highlighting the regional variations in the prevalence of villainage. Extensive manors with large concentrations of unfree tenants were common in Huntingdonshire, and overall, villainage was most prevalent in the arable heartland of the Midland. In contrast, areas where farmland was being newly carved out of woodland witnessed a lower concentration of villain. In these areas, 
lords were eager to attract new tenants, offering more attractive terms, often involving greater freedom and fewer obligations to incentivize settlement. Despite the regional variations, by 1290, roughly three out of five English tenants were categorized as unfree. This widespread prevalence of villainage suggests that the traditional view of a clear distinction between free and unfree may have oversimplified the realities of medieval rural life. Some individuals classified as free might have faced restrictions that were not always recognized, blurring the lines between these seemingly distinct social categories. One such group, the Silkmen, a class of small farmers in the Danelaw, were often assumed to be descended from free Viking colonists who had retained their freedom. While there is truth to this notion, their freedoms were not absolute. Silkmen, while often subject to lighter labor services compared to the average villain, still faced obligations and restrictions that placed them within a system of limited autonomy. Even Sokomen could find themselves classified as unfree by an ambitious lord, seeking to expand his power and control. This ambiguity regarding the status of Sokomen highlights the complex and often fluid nature of social categories in medieval England. The distinction between free and unfree was not always clear-cut, with individuals often occupying a gray area, subject to varying degrees of freedom and obligation, depending on the specific circumstances of their manner and the intentions of their lord. The same complexity existed within the church estates, which presented a mixed picture of both unfree and free communities. The Benedictine monks established in England for centuries held many of their estates in arable areas, often employing a significant number of villain tenants. The Cistercians, in contrast, focused on wool production on their vast estates in the north and west, mixing free and unfree laborers in their workforce. This practice likely influenced by the demanding nature of wool production, which required a diverse and flexible labor force, reveals the economic factors that could shape the social structure of individual estates. The Templars and Augustinians, with their land holdings scattered across multiple villages, often opted for money rents from free tenants, finding it more difficult to manage labor service obligations across geographically dispersed estates. This preference for monetary transactions, driven by practical considerations of administration and efficiency, further demonstrates the varied approaches to land management and labor relations within the church. The medieval English countryside, therefore, was not a uniform landscape of either complete freedom or absolute servitude. The reality was a mosaic of variations, shaped by local customs, the ambitions of lords, and the resilience of villains. Even within the confines of villainage, a spectrum of experiences existed, ranging from the hardships of near slavery to the relative prosperity of those who defied the constraints of their legal status. The desire for autonomy and the struggle for a better life were universal themes that resonated throughout medieval society, shaping the individual and collective destinies of those who lived, labored, and endured within its complex and often ambiguous social structures.